Hello and welcome to video number two for the Dainsu Archaeological Mapping Project. So first let me just give props to a friend of mine. This is Nezwo Koyoch Uh He's named after a, an Aztec deity and an Aztec king. He is uh, Mexican. He's an archaeologist that also is working on his PhD at Tulane and he came and spent a season with me helping me uh, do the mapping project. Behind him is Nestor. Uh, who is a member of the community of uh, Makotsochitl. Here we are working with the total station. I was with the rod. This is at the very summit of the mountain of Cerro Danush. I was holding the rod and these two were collecting the data. So this is an Inehi map. Inehi is essentially Mexico's statistics department and they basically create maps similar to the USGS, uh, one in 24,000 uh, topographic maps, but they also do a whole lot of other things. They take the census, they do all, all kinds of things. They are, they are a great source of information. In any case, I got a map from them and I sat down with the aerial photography that was taken by the earlier archeological survey group. And we went through and we devised a systematic mapping project that took us eight years. And over that time, we very carefully walked the region between the two mountains and we measured a whole mess of points. We measured about 20,000 points with the total station. And those, these are the gray points here. So you can see these points are all geo-referenced, right? Because this is a UTM map and all the points here were geo-referenced so that we could just overlay them right on top of any map. We could overlay them on top of Google Earth images. We could overlay them on top of aerial photographs. So it's pretty cool that every point is geo-referenced. Likewise, we measured another 6,000 points with the GPS, and those are all the dark black points. And we did those using a GPS device. And we used both a GPS and a total station to make sure that we were properly uh, giving the UTM coordinates. So the total station, as far as a mapping device, is far more accurate than a GPS is. However, the GPS will keep you, as long as you take many GPS points and you triangulate, it will keep your total station honest. And so, meaning you'll be able to geo-reference everything into that GIS database. Remember, GIS stands for Geographic Information System and essentially is just a database. So the beginning of our database were all the coordinates of all the points we measured in UTM numbers. So, uh, so we had a point north, a point east, and then for elevation we used the total station numbers because way more accurate. And remember, elevation and GPS isn't so good because they approximate that the Earth's surface is smooth and almost perfectly elliptical, and that's not the case. In fact, we were standing on a mountain. So this is an elevation model, similar to what LIDAR does. This is an elevation model that we created with our map, with our mapping data. We created this three-dimensional model and we overlaid all of the structures that we mapped within it. So we identified all those structures that were found in the 1960s and 70s during the survey project, all those 150 mounds, and we actually pinpointed their locations on this map. Uh, to be fair, we didn't locate all 150 mounds because some of them are in the regions that we still have yet to map, and hopefully I'll get going down there soon to map those as well. Uh, most of this territory today is uh, taken up by farmers' fields, so we had to go into the town and ask not just the council and the mayor for permission to do all this, but we also had to get permission from the individual people who were plowing those fields. Uh, everyone was super cooperative. Everyone really liked our project. It was really a, a fun, uh, after they got to know us a little bit, uh, they invited us to all their festivals and things like that. It was a real, uh, it was a really great experience. Uh, so you can see, remember in that map that was made by the town, here's that river that flows down along. It's a seasonal river. It's only running during the wet season. During the dry season, it pretty much dries up. There's a few pools 
that remain in slow bends like here and over here and there's actually fish in them and things but the there's no connection between those pools until the rainy season comes again and then the river starts flowing again it's pretty fascinating so you can see this is a pretty large area this is roughly um two and a half kilometers across here and about almost two kilometers across this way so a lot of work a lot of individual mapping there are two mountains involved climbing up and down these mountains all the time but we basically were able to see that some cool things about the archaeological site first of all the site involved a lot of planning so when the city was constructed some 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago was the first construction in this, in this ancient city. When it was first constructed, the architects and the leaders of the town had plans. It's very clear to us after this mapping project. And first up, there are three site divisions. And so two of them are religious in nature and they involve a lot of temples and religious iconography, and those are the two mountains. And we can consider those sacred mountains. And even today, as I mentioned earlier in the last uh, video, these two mountains are sacred, and people go and leave offerings and stuff to this day on top of them. And all, both of them have temple structures on their summits and, and lots of icono religious iconography around them. And then there are a couple other neighborhoods. Uh, this is a bit more of a rural neighborhood. This is a more dense occupation. This is a more dense occupation. This area number three is actually probably where all the business took place. And so the main palace was located right there. And there was a main plaza right there that's been destroyed a lot by plowing, but there's still markers of it. And then there were some other neighborhoods. But the main three sections were the valley floor, which is where most of the people lived and where most of the agriculture took place and where most of the business type activities took place. Then there were two religious centers uh, associated with these mountains. So let's just show you some other things we can do with the mapping. We use these 3D images and we can rotate them to discuss what do we mean by neighborhoods. Well, we saw at the archaeological site that there was all these uh, divisions, and we found that in several different places, separated from each other, but surrounded by commoner houses, we found two pyramids with, remember, Mesoamerican pyramids housed temples. So you can see here are the two pyramids here. This is the same map. This is a plan map, and this is just a side 3D image showing you. So this is the base of Cerro Danush. And then there are two pyramids here. Each one of those had a temple on top of it. And then there's a plaza between them. And then down here, there is an uh, elevated platform where there was a palace. So you can see that from the side, the two temples, the, the um, patio, and then this palace structure. So one of these things we noticed right away in our mapping project is that there were several of these temple uh, palace precincts throughout the site. And then they were surrounded by much more uh, humble houses, I should say. So lots of commoner houses surrounding a palace. And so we viewed this as a neighborhood center. So this is, so you know, just like cities today, you might have town hall and with the, with the Capitol building and the judicial center. But then radiating out, there are neighborhoods, and each of these neighborhoods have things like public libraries and maybe a courthouse or something like that. Well, that's what was going on at Dainsu. They had neighborhood administrative centers that probably controlled the farming community surrounding it. So cool. So the uh, mapping project helped us identify site divisions, so intra-site divisions that weren't readily available from earlier research. And we have a really good characterization of at least 13 different neighborhoods that we could identify from our mapping project. And so now we can do things like start excavating in those neighborhoods and things like that to get further information. Well, another part of the mapping project was understanding the ritual landscape surrounding Dainsu. And I just added Makotsu here because most of 
Dines, the archaeological site of Dainzu is located on the communal lands of Makotsochil. And many of these mountains are named mountains and carry ritual significance even today. And we found during our mapping project that the ritual significance of these mountains has been around for a very, very long time. So we wanted to understand what was the relationship between these mountains and the ancient community. And so in the next couple of slides, I'm going to be talking to you about, or not slides, but the next couple of videos, I'm going to talk to you about what we found at these centers.